Read out of 1 Samuel chapter number 21. Also, our sister was here before service looking for a pair of glasses. I don't know. She don't know if they were left here, but uh, if there was a pair of glasses here that you found, uh, they belong to her. And she's looking for them. And She'd love to give them, get them back. She's like me. I'm blind without mine. I can't ever lose mine because if I take them off and go about five steps, I'm like, I can't see. So, <laughs> so you can't lose them if you can't see without them. I mean, that's the shape I'm in. I wake up in the morning, go to the bathroom, get the stirring around. It don't take me long to say, man, I forgot to put my glasses on. First Samuel chapter number 21, we're going to read verse number 9. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it. For there is none other save that here. David said, there's none like that. Give it me. And uh, I, I was reading that. Never, never seen it. Kind of like God showed it to me this time. And I, I want to preach to you on this thought. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Father, we thank you for the word of God tonight. I just pray. You'll speak to our hearts. I thank you for speaking to us this morning. God, for allowing your spirit to speak to us. Uh, God, what you've done in Brother Ricky Kennedy's family and bringing all three of his grandchildren to the altar this morning, praying to be saved. God, I thank you so much for that. And God, that was one of those moments like I'm about to preach about where there's nothing else like it in the whole world that can be compared to it. I pray, oh God, that that experience would become a reality in every heart and every life. That this altar service tonight would be one of those kind of moments in our life that there's nothing else like it in all the world. And God, that we would ask of you tonight, that's what we desire. God, that in Christ, that there's nothing else like it in the whole world. That's what we desire from you tonight. Touch us. I pray, just as we prayed this morning, if there's someone here that needs to be saved, born again, to seek you through repentance, I pray that you would draw them to an altar. And I pray, oh God, if there's someone here that needs the miracle of healing in their body, oh God, that with his stripes tonight, we would leave here healed. And I pray, oh God, for those that yet need the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that they would hunger and thirst, God, to be filled in this altar, you would pour out your spirit. We would all leave full of the Holy Ghost. Grant it, we pray in Jesus' mighty name. If you love him, would you say amen? amen. Well, in our in our text, we, we find in the setting David is fleeing from Saul. And he is fleeing actually for crimes he didn't commit. He is slew Goliath by the sword everybody was happy about that when he returned home they were singing songs about him David for Saul has killed his thousands but David has killed his tens of thousands and Saul when he heard it man an evil spirit just leaped on the inside of him set up a jealousy there that says from that moment he began to eye David in a very hateful manner and said, well, they've ascribed to him slaying tens of thousands and me only thousands. What more can they give him besides the throne itself? And uh, he held a javelin in his hand and just a few verses down, 
he wanted to nail David to the wall with the javelin that he held in his hand. And when David realized this man hates me for no good reason, he hates, he hates me and wants to kill me, David began to flee. Saul began to pursue him. And when David was on the run, he and a band of men that had joined themselves to him, he sought refuge in the house of God. And I believe that's where we should all seek refuge. This is a good, safe place, or at least it ought to be. The house of God around these altars, I've received help more times than I could ever count. God has helped me more right on these hallowed grounds. I've got help in the company of the saints, and I've got help before in here all by myself. But this, this hallowed out place has been a meeting place between me and God. I've got help right here on these grounds over the space of the last 20 plus years, more times than I could ever count. And David went to Shiloh to the house of God and sought out the priesthood. And uh, he didn't exactly tell him the truth. But he said, I'm on business for the king. It just wasn't Saul. It was the king of kings. Yeah. And he said, uh, I didn't bring anything with me for the king's business requires haste. I'm in a hurry. And he said, if you don't, if you got anything to eat, I sure would be glad. He said, I don't have nothing here but the show bread. If your men have, have hallowed themselves, if they're sanctified, uh, or have been for the last three days, I can give that to you. He said, oh yeah, we are. He gave him the showbread, and he said, you wouldn't happen to have a, a spear or a sword lying around anywhere, would you? The priest said, oh, we ain't got nothing like that around here. He said, but I do have the sword of Goliath, whom you slew in the battle. It's wrapped up in a linen cloth behind the ephod, we got it here. You can have it if you want it. He said, oh, yeah. Give it to me. There's nothing like that, not in all of Israel. As I was, as I was reading that, uh, God dealt with my heart because I believe that David was reminded at the mention of Goliath's sword, he was reminded of God's power and ability to preserve his life because that giant was threatening David and all the armies of Israel I'm going to take your head and lift it off your body and feed your carcass to the fowls of the air we're going to make all your people and all your wives and children our slaves and our servants and your people are going to worship our God and he was trying to intimidate David with fear and if you looked at him he was, to be, he was very intimidating. He was a giant. Some commentary, you know, anywhere from 9 to 13 feet, depending on what commentary you read, and that just seems unbelievable. 9 foot or 13 foot, it don't matter. David was a little boy. And that, that man, much of a man, was intimidating. I've stood up against guys my height or a little bit taller, built like a brick house, and think I wouldn't want to tango with him. I wouldn't want to try to mess with that guy. He he'd hurt you bad. Can you imagine what looking at a giant, somebody that dwarfed you, and his intention is to kill you? And the Bible said he's been a champion of war, of battlefield since he was a boy. Obviously, he was a he was a, a man among men even when he was a boy, being a giant. And it sounded like he's never been beat, that he was undefeated, and every threat he had ever made, he had backed it up. And there's a lot to be intimidated by, but David said, you come against me with spear and shield and sword, but I come against you yeah. in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen. He said, you need to come over here, boy. I'm going to cut your head off, feed your body, 
to the fowls of the air. He said, I'm about to lift your head. We're going to be feeding your body to the fowls. And he said, so that everybody may know that there is a God in Israel that answers prayer. And uh, we know the rest of that story, but when he saw that sword, I believe it was a reminder of God's power and ability to preserve his life, not from Goliath this time, but from Saul. God's care to sustain him by the, by the showbread and also God's might to save him from his enemies, whether foreign or domestic, Goliath or Saul. His eyes popped at that sword of Goliath, and he said, give that to me. There's nothing like that in all of Israel. The interesting side note, Israel is still in the Bronze Age under Saul's reign, meaning they didn't, have, they didn't yet have the hearths that were able to uh, blow hot enough to produce iron. All they could produce was brass. But the Canaanites were already in the Iron Age. They, they had knowledge of how to produce iron. They had iron chariots. None of the weaponry of Israel could penetrate those iron chariots. Uh, Goliath had a, his spearhead was iron, while all of Israel's spearheads were brass. His sword was iron, while all of Israel's swords were brass. And when you pop that brass sword against that iron sword, your brass sword just breaks off. And you can understand why the people of God may have felt so inferior and intimidated the people that had them outnumbered and outgunned. They, they were inferior in every way except for the fact that God was on their side. <laughs> no wonder the writer of the New Testament said, if God be for us, who then can be against us? We're more than conquerors. We're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So Goliath had a, a spear and also a sword of iron, and I believe that is what David was talking about when he said, oh yeah, give me that sword. There's not another sword like that in all of Israel. I mean, that sword was iron. It was strong. It was powerful. It was sharp. David had never held another sword like it. That sword represented his greatest, most mighty and awesome victory that he had ever experienced in his life. When he drew Shuri through the, the stone and it sank in Goliath's forehead and he fell to the ground, but the Bible didn't say he was dead. He just knocked the fire out of him. Knocked him silly and knocked him out. And David pulled Goliath's own sword out of his sheath and cut his head off with the sword. And then Goliath was it was with that sword in his hand that David had experienced the greatest victory in his life. And he said, there's not another sword like that in all the land of Israel. Give it to me. That sword of iron symbolic of God's power in the life of the believer. You say, how so? Because there's nothing equal to that. Not in all the world. Not the armies of the USA. Not the armies of Russia or China or any other force or power. Not even the demonic hordes and principalities of hell or any match for the man or the woman of God full of the Holy Ghost. Thanks be to God. That's why the Bible calls you more than a conqueror through him that loved us. Amen. You are a conqueror. He told Moses, 
he said, nobody's going to be able to stand against you. And he told Joshua, as I was with Moses, so shall I also be with you. Everywhere the sole of your foot trods, I'll give you the land and no man will be able to stand before you. Be strong. Be courageous. For I, the Lord, am with you. Thanks be to God. I want to tell you, David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. There's nothing equal to the presence and the power of God in the life of a believer. There's nothing like that in all the world. That's what that sword represented. This is 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I don't fight the devil. I don't fight spiritual battles with a 30 alt 6 a 270 with an AR-15 or any other kind of weaponry. I don't fight with spear or shield or sword. I fight like David fought. I come against you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Except for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That means earthly or fleshly. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. You know, imaginations are what war against your mind. That's what an imagination is. Is something that wars against your mind. And there are some things that war against the mind that seem they fight you harder than things that are coming against you in reality. Most battles in your mind are far worse than they are in reality because they make you think you can't win. Yeah, right. In your mind, they won't allow you to see or possess victory. Yes. Yeah. In your mind, you can't even listen to reason. Right. All you can hear is defeat. Right, right, right. All you can hear and know in your mind is bondage yeah. right. and vexation. But the Bible said the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination. When I talk to you about the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ or the power of the Holy Spirit working in our heart and in our life or the weaponry that God equips us with in Christ, that uh, will cast down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we preached on a few weeks ago, knowledge through intimacy. The knowledge of God, the word knowledge there is the, is the Greek word gnosko, which uh, describes intimacy. The intimacy of a husband and a wife. Everything, every high thing that exalts itself or raises itself up against your relationship with God. Anything that tries to keep you from getting closer to God is a spirit sent from hell. And the Holy Ghost and the Word of God by the Spirit is sent to cast it down. To put it down. To slay it like David slew Goliath. Amen. I mean, if need be, to cut its head off. It, right. If need be, like Samuel, we, we mentioned Agag. Samuel drew his sword and hew Agag into pieces. That is what God desires to do to all things that would exalt itself against you getting close to God. Amen. 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 Then he said, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 
I want to tell you, you can let the devil talk to you if you want to. But any thought that comes into my mind that doesn't submit itself to the authority of God's word or Christ himself, I'm, ki I'm kicking that out. That's right. I'm casting that out. Every thought is to be brought into the obedience of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I, I've been going about my merry way of many a day. I ain't cussed in 30 years. I've been going about my merry way a lot of days. And an ugly word just enter into my mind. And do you know the enemy, the way he works, will then try to accuse you of thinking that ugly thought and condemn you in my mind. And I just remind him, that didn't come from Christ. That came from you. Listen, you work around it all the time. You go into Walmart, you sit in a restaurant and in the booth right next to you, whether it be a teenager or somebody with gray in their hair, they talk more filth and use more profanity than you'd ever want to hear in your lifetime. Amen. You go to, you know, to any secular event, uh, they're going to talk filth and trash. Right, right. That's it. If you look at anything on a television or even, even try to listen to a, a talk show on the radio, they talk filth and trash. Right. Yes. One of those words can come into my mind and the, they will say, you ain't holy. You have that word in your mind. I say, that word didn't come from God. That word come from this evil world. Yeah. I wasn't thinking that. I don't want to say that. And I would never under any circumstances ever say that. Get out of my mind. Yeah. You don't belong there. Yeah. Every thought is brought under obedience of yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. If Christ didn't put it there, then it's to be put down. Yeah. If Christ wouldn't want you to think it, uh, it's to be put down. Right. Any source that would cause you to think it uh, or want to think it uh, is to be put down. Amen. Right. Amen. David said, I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes. I'm not going to look at stuff that's going to make me lust in my mind to be a fertile ground of perversion. I ain't doing that. And that's to be brought into the obedience of Jesus Christ. Our weaponry, though not carnal, though not earthly, you're not loading a gun, you're not sharpening a sword, you're not uh, carrying around a spear. I wish that I wish it was that easy that I could get my sights on the devil and line him up in the crosshairs and put one between his eyes. Oh my! I would sign up in a New York. Second, say, I'll be your sniper right here, Lord. I know where he's going to show up. Wherever somebody's trying to do anything good for God, that's where he's going to show up. I'll just set up on the hillside. When he comes messing around with Brother Philip or Sister Vicky, I'm going to put one between his eyes. And then it'll all be over. Man, that'd be easy. I would sign up for that. Any day of the week. But he said, though our weaponry is not carnal, you're not loading a rifle or sharpening a sword or thrusting him through with a spear. Our weaponry is mighty through God. Yeah. You say, well, what weaponry do we have? I'm telling you, weaponry, that there's nothing else like it in all of the world. You say, what weaponry do we have? The Bible said you've got... The not the sword of Goliath, but the sword of the Spirit, yeah. which is the Word of God. Listen, that's the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel yeah. to every creature. Amen. It's all Christ used on the devil. He didn't use some Son of God, heavenly authority, and pierce the devil through with some supernatural weapon that we don't have access to. Jesus didn't have laser vision like Superman. Just shoot the devil through 
with his laser vision because he didn't give me laser vision. Jesus, you know, unlike Superman, couldn't stop a bullet. Because he didn't give me that weaponry to stop a bullet. Being not weaponry, we could bend steel, outrun a locomotive, leap over a tall building, fly around. None of that. Yet I... I'm mighty through God. I've got weaponry in me that defeats the devil not just some of the time, but all of the time. I want to let you know again, if Satan could have killed me over the last 30 years, uh, there'd be a marker with my name on it uh, a long time ago. If Satan could have done away with the church, the church would be ancient history and there wouldn't be a church. If Satan could put out of existence the nation of Israel that God prophesied over in his word, there wouldn't be a little nation called Israel being fought over tonight. It's there because God is greater. I'm here because God is greater. The church is here because God is greater. Listen, what, what weaponry do we have that there's nothing else like it in all the world? I mean, more powerful than an atomic bomb. The gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Amen. That man from Gadara is full of at least 2,000 devils. He's got enough devils in him to choke out 2,000 head of swine and cause them to run off the cliff and, and kill themselves in the sea. There's enough devils in that man to cause nobody to want to even travel to that part of town. He's been bound. He's been through every rehab program. The Bible said no man could tame him. No man could solve him. No man could fix him. But he was he, he had been bound often with fetters and chains and broke him asunder. People had tried to rehabilitate him. People had tried to incarcerate him. People had tried to, you know, to put him through their step programs. He run around naked cut himself uh, with stones, uh, cried day and night, was a wild man, was a mad man. He was full of the devil and utterly demonic, uh, but one word from Jesus, uh, and he's clothed uh, and in his right mind. Uh, and he is, uh, God made a preacher out of him. Yeah. Yeah. Go and tell your friends uh, the great things that God has done for you. Thanks be to God. This gospel, Christ, is the centric theme of the gospel. When you learn the Bible's a book of, about Jesus, type and shout in the Old Testament reality in the New Testament. This book is a book about Christ. He said, search the scriptures. For in them you think that you have eternal life, yet they are they which do testify of me. If you read the book uh, and can't find Jesus, uh, it's because you need to be born again. Amen. But once you're born again, everything you read in the book uh, points you to Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. This book is a revelation of God's Son. Right, right. Its spirit is truths are spiritually discerned. And once discerned, they make you free. Hallelujah. Whoa, hallelujah to God. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus have made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which includes the message of the blood, the blood that was shed for me, the atonement of my sin. My sins aren't just covered up. You lift up the, the floor mat. 
Ooh-wee. Look at look at Brother Eddie's past. Look at that dirty, wretched past he's got. There's all of his sins right there. My sins were not only covered. The Bible said that he removed my sin. He justified me in Christ. And the word justification is a legal term in the Greek. It is the legal terminology that you and I would hear when we stand before a judge and he hits the gavel. The verdict is not guilty. Justified is the equivalency of a pardon, which means the expungement of your record. Just as if I had never sinned is what justification, justified, justified, never sinned. That's literally what it means. Not only did he cover my sin, but he removed my sin away from me as far as the east is from the west. He washed me from my sin in his own blood. He translated me out of darkness into the marvelous light. There's no record of my sin. My sins are gone. He purged my conscience from dead works that I can serve the living God. There ain't another book in the whole world that can take your wretched deeds and cast them away from you. There ain't another book in all the world that can make a drunk man sober, that can set the addict free, that can heal the leper, that can give sight to the blind, can make a deaf man hear or a lame man walk. But this book can. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That's good preaching. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Give that to me. Come on. Give it to me. Yeah. There's nothing else like that in all of the world. Yeah. Yeah. This book is your answer. That's right. Woo, hallelujah to God. Yeah. I want to say it again. Oh. This book is my answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give me the word of God. Give me the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's some, some of these verses in here that say thou shalt not, but it's still the answer. There's some verses in here that will cut you. That will circumcise. The Bible says the foreskin of the heart mean the cutting away of the flesh. The old timers, Brother Bob, called it sanctification. Some of the things of carnality that God will put down and cut out of your life. Some of the places I used to go, I don't go no more. Why? Because this book makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Give it to me because I don't like who I was. I don't want to be who I used to be ever again. Give it to me. Preach it straight. Preach it hot. Preach it anointed. I want it. If something in me is not Christ, cut it away. There's a cancer growing in me called sin. Pull that scalpel out. Do the surgery that needs to be required. That don't belong in me. It's a cancerous growth. It's a tumor. It's going to hurt. It's going to take some time for you to get past it. Get over it. i recover. Cut it out. Lest it kill me. Yeah. 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 Woo. Hallelujah. There ain't another book like this in the whole world. There ain't another gospel like this anywhere. I'm going to tell you, Muhammad and the Quran will let a man be a pedophile and still go to heaven. The Quran will let a group of, uh, let a group of people called Hamas uh, cut babies' heads off, uh, burn them alive, uh, kill old men and old women and children, uh, rape women, uh, and still get to go to heaven. This book right here will make you love your enemy. Hey, hallelujah to God. This book right here the Bible says if you plant it in your heart, you'll make even your enemies to be at peace with you. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. Some of you looking at me like you don't believe it. Give it to me. There ain't nothing else like that in the whole world. I want this gospel. I want all of it. Christ, the blood, atonement, pardon, repentance. Oh, yeah. Repentance. What does that mean? The Bible said if we confess our sin, 1 John 1 and 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repentance will bring forgiveness. People won't give it to you. God will. God will. Healing. You know, in this book, it's a doctrine of healing. Thank God for it. As you get old, you're going to need it. You get old, you're going to need it. Your bones ain't hurting while you're young, but they will. Your knees are in good shape while you're a teenager, but they'll, they'll get bad on you. Your back and your neck's just fine when you're a teenage boy. You, you, you work, pull, strain, lift. All that stuff long enough. Uh, you'll need it. Your eyes are, most people, some people were born with bad eyes. For the most part, till I hit 40, my eyes were perfect. Never need no glasses. Start out with reading glasses. Then went to prescribed glasses. Then went to bifocals all in the space of about three years. I said to the doctor, what's wrong? 40 years ago, I was, or, or or three years ago, I was 2015, better than 2020. I'm wearing bifocals. I'm going blind. He laughed. He said, you're getting old. Come on. Come on. I said, but I always quoted the promise. As I was with Moses, so shall I also be with thee. He was 120. His natural force was not abated, and his eyes never grew dim. I wanted that one to be mine, Lord. <laughs> I wanted to be strong at 120, and I didn't have on to wear glasses. And I was reading one night, just pondering on the promise of God. God said to me, Brother Bob, you've got as much of me as you want. You've got as much of my power, my victory, and my anointing as you want to have. He said, if you, if you lived in an age where there was no corrective lens, where there was no magnifying glass, uh, you lived in an age uh, to where you couldn't see. And I walked by one Sunday morning uh, or one Sunday night, uh, you could cry, Jesus, yeah. have mercy on me. And I'd say, what do you want? Uh, I need to see. I can't see to read my Bible. I can't see to drive down the road. I need my sight. Uh, and he said, I would do it. Amen. I would do it. Uh, he said, but you got glasses. Uh, you don't need me. Put them back on, brother Eddie. Can't see. You understand what I'm telling you? Yeah. This book preaches healing. Yeah. We recommend the doctors. Mm. You need to go over there to Lens Crafter. That's where I get mine. They got a good optometrist over there. They can set you up real good. I don't ever do I don't preach doctors. I don't recommend doctors. I recommend them. That'll be the day they get sued for my practice because they mess up. They ain't perfect. They practice medicine. But Jesus is a healer. And I highly recommend it. Hallelujah. I said Jesus is a healer. And I highly recommend it. I got healed twice in my life. I told you once was that knee years ago when I was pastoring Somerdale. Had no insurance, couldn't bend, it swole up with fluid. 
I was sure something was probably torn in it. I cried. I said, Lord, I sure need you to touch this knee. I don't know what's wrong with it, but I can't afford to go to the doctor. Next morning, I got up, went back, worked that flower bed all day. Bent down just fine. Holy Ghost said, you ain't even thanked me for healing your knee yet. I said, oh, man, my knee's healed. Hey, I got a lot of things wrong with me, but at 52, Ain't nothing wrong with that knee. Yeah. Hallelujah. Only other time I ever need to be healed, two months of agony with my neck. And when God said to me, you can go to that neck doctor, he'll make you better. Just don't talk to me about your doctor no more. Telling me how many days I've got to heal you before you go to the doctor. Either you believe I'll heal you or just go to the doctor. But quit telling me what day your surgery's on. If you want me to heal you, I will. I called and canceled the surgery. I didn't know, Brother Bob, if I'd wait six months, six days, or six hours. But in my spirit, I said to God, you are a healer. I know you can, and I believe you will. And when I woke up the next morning, it was done. Hey, my God, it was done. I'll recommend that to, to anybody. There's nothing like that feeling in all the world. You go to bed hurting, but you wake up well. There ain't nothing like that. You walk into church lost, you go home saved. There ain't nothing else like that. I could testify for some of the rest of you. I watched God heal Brother Jonathan's back. I watched God heal Brother Ray. I watched God heal Sister Faye. I watched God heal their grandson, Little Gray. Amen. Cancer's intended to kill you. There ain't nothing like hearing a report saying, ain't no cancer in you. And the doctor tells you you're supposed to die. Well, we give you a 14% chance to live. That's what they gave. Cap, I can't even think of his name right now. What's Morgan. That's what they gave Morgan. Double hit, large B-cell lymphoma. 14% chance you're going to go through so many months of treatment. You get to this point, we're going to put you on a, 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 a chemo that's so strong and powerful and severe, they call it Red Devil. That's how sick it makes you. Once you get through that and you're going to think that you're going to die, then we're going to do the stem cell transplant. we got to kill every stem cell in all your bones and then grow stem cells uh, in a lab, we're going to get you as close to dead as you can possibly get without dying. And then we're going to start, the, you know, all the cells, the process of growing all new cells in your body. And that's the only chance you have of living. And three months in, they run a test. And there ain't no cancer. He said, that means the medicine's working. They just smile. He says, sir, we don't have no medicine that works like that. It works that fast. You ain't even made it to the red devil. And the cancer's gone. We're just going to stop the treatments on you and do a check on you every six months and see if it tries to come back. But we ain't putting you through all that if the cancer's already gone. Hallelujah! He's not attending church, but I still call to check on him. He's got a 14% you know, sticker on his boat that he works on every day. And he put it on, it's about that big around, says 14%. He does that so when people ask him, what's the 14%? He said, that's a chance I had of living, but the Lord healed me. Yeah. Hallelujah to God. I recommend a Savior like that to any 
body. His Holy Ghost baptism. Oh, thanks be to God. I ain't ashamed of being Pentecostal. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, under the uttermost parts of the earth. This Holy Ghost power that has enabled me to preach the gospel. By the Holy Ghost power that has anointed me to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. That has anointed me in different parts of the world to preach and cast out devils, to see cancers fall off. To see, I've literally seen the lame throw their, uh, their crutches down and run out of a cast uh, on the bottom of the leg. It busts off their leg while they're running down the street. Uh, somebody asked me, what happened? I said, don't know. What was wrong with them? Didn't ask. I just seen them drop the crutches, uh, take off running, and bits and pieces of cast were flying off uh, while they was going down the road shouting. I'll just tell you whatever's wrong got made right. I can't do that. There ain't enough power in that hand to swat a fly on the wall and kill it. But under the power of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah to God. Any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with oil. Pray it over them in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise them up. I ain't going to deny that. I'm not going to be embarrassed of that. Somebody shouts in here. Somebody speaks in tongues, the interpretation of tongues, a, a word of prophecy, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. Uh, I'm not going to be ashamed of that. The Bible said despise, not prophesy. The Bible said grieve, not the spirit. Uh, quench, not the spirit. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to welcome uh, the movement of the spirit uh, and the admiration of the gifts uh, and the anointing of the Holy Ghost uh, to work in my life. I, I, I recall it as a funny story. Sister Erica ain't with us no more. She's in heaven. Back on that original keyboard we had, she'd tell Brother Ed, I can't play. I just, I kind of chord. I can hit the chords. Well, we had a bass player and a drummer beat the tambourine. You, people singing, you couldn't really tell that she wasn't a great piano player. She just she just courted with us and we got anointed and it worked. I come in here one Wednesday night. There was a woman. I don't want to seem mean here, judgmental or anything else. There was a woman coming here from a neighboring church. She had her flag because that's how they worship. She brought her flag in here, tucked it underneath her, her pew. I'll tell you, wave whatever you want. It don't make you anointed. You dance however you want. It don't mean you're dancing in the Holy Ghost or that it's anointed of God. I've danced before. Kim said it looked something akin to what an Indian chief would have done around a, around a war fire somewhere. It sure didn't look like no dancing. <laughs> but that's what my feet did. I danced another time. I was in McClenny, Florida. Holy Ghost got on me and I, I just I just danced me a jig all around the altar. It come an absolute monsoon rain flood. That evening city had been in a drought. Brother Donnie said, we found a dilemma. So the droughts, book Brother Eddie, let him do that rain dance in your altar, and the drought will be over. <laughs> I'm just telling you, she brought the flag that night because that's how they worship. I didn't know she had a flag. I wouldn't have said nothing to her because I, I don't, I don't want to be mean or oppressive. I wouldn't have said nothing to her. If I'd have seen, I wouldn't have said, hey, 
got a flag in here. You better get that flag out of here later. I would have, I would have said that. I didn't see it. We come in. We started that night. This is pre-Corey Brown. Pre-Corey Brown. Brother Eddie's the worship leader. I'm leading worship. Sister Erica, this is pre-Kirsten on the piano. We're going back early days. Sister Erica's on the piano, I think. Sister Darlene, Sister Kirsten was behind the mic helping me sing. We were singing, keep on the fire in line. Yeah. If you're in the battle for the Lord and right, keep on the fire in line. If you win, my brother, surely you must fight. Keep on the fire in line. There are many dangers that we almost almost face. If we die fighting, it is no disgrace. Coward in the service, he will find no place. Keep on the fire in line. You must fight. Be brave against all evil. I'm telling you, somewhere in the middle of that, maybe the second verse in, I felt the power of the Holy Ghost. I got the high step. I got the coming across there. I'd run out of platform, I'd high step back. I got about, I started singing and kind of doing a little dance. Back and across the platform, Sister Erica stopped playing the piano. Y'all ever heard Sister Erica shout? She had a good set of lungs on her. It's a, it was a high tenor shout. Ah! Around in a circle she went, spinning like a top. Didn't bother me a bit. I just kept right on singing. You must fight. Be brave against all evil. Didn't bother the Holy Ghost none. People right on, shouting right on, worshiping right on. We had a Holy Ghost service that night. I got home, Kim said. Oh, I was holding my breath. Holding my breath. Saying, oh, when he sees that woman. Marching around this church, waving that flag. He's going to tell her to sit down. As sure as I'm sitting here, he's going to say something to her. I'm worshiping with my eyes closed, as I do a lot of time. I'm a shouting, running, dancing, and singing. Sister Erica let out one of them Holy Ghost uh, war hollers. That woman, Sister Erica, hollered. She, Turned around in shock and amazement. Flipped that flag under her arm. Rolled it up real quick. Out that door she went. Kim said, I was so scared of what you was going to say to that woman with that flag. I said, what woman? She said, the woman with the flag. She made two laps around the church with the flag. You never saw the woman with the flag. I said, I ain't seen no woman with no flag. She said, oh, my God, open your eyes. I said, I ain't seen no woman with no flag. Thank God I'd have quenched the spirit, maybe. I didn't need to do nothing. When that that's real shows up, that that ain't will go away. There ain't nothing like that in the earth, nowhere. Somebody said, hey, you start a church. I pastor this church. Man, I got more fruit cakes and fruit loops and nut jobs and problems. I'm about ready to beat my head against a brick wall or pull my hair out or resign. How do you deal with all that stuff? I said, no, I don't really. He said, what do you mean you don't? You, you don't have to deal with this one doing this and this one. I said, hey, I found out that book does most of the dealing. Just preach the word. Just preach what God speaks to your heart in that secret place because God is a mile ahead of you. He sees what's already down the line. He can deal with their heart and stop them in their tracks. He can deal with them if brothers against brother, sisters against sister. In one message, he can speak to their heart and they're forgiving that one and that one's forgiving that one and this one's apologizing and I never knew it.
never deal with a whole lot of flesh because the gospel's intended to do that. If you preach this and it ain't real, it either gets right or it gets gone. I had some that we hired in because Brother Eddie needed help. We had two strikes on me and I didn't even get a foul tip. Just swing and miss both times. I said to the Lord, that's the end of that. I won't be hiring no outside help from here on out. If you don't raise somebody up from within our ranks, I'll just man the guns alone. Because I'm telling you, I got burnt bad two times. And the Lord said, all right, now that you're ready to do it my way instead of your way, I'll raise somebody up. But as long as you think, oh, I'll just hire somebody in of my liking, of my choosing. And that's what we'll do. As long as you want to do it that way, do it. After two swings and misses, I said, Lord, I ain't doing it no more. I'll just preach so you raised somebody up one Wednesday night. Brother Corey had started coming here on, only on Wednesdays while he was going to Faulkner. Anybody remember where Faulkner was at? Yeah. One campus in Bangladesh, and it was Faulkner, not coastal Alabama. Back in the Faulkner days, Corey came on a Wednesday night. He was laying on his face in the altar and tears dripping off his cheeks. I looked down at him, and the Lord said, there's... There's a man I'm going to raise up to help you right there. And if I would have thought he was going to get my oldest daughter, I might have told him to leave. <laughs> I love you, Brother Corey. <laughs> if I would have known he was, he was going to get my, my baby, I might would have told him, you need to get out of here, boy. I'm going to wait for him to raise up somebody that's already married. I wouldn't change a thing. When God does it, it works. Right. Give me that. Yeah. Ain't nothing, yeah. nothing like that in the whole world. So we got the gospel and everything it entails. You got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, all the power, unction, anointing it entails. And you got the testimony of believers yeah. and the fellowship of the saints give me a good church give me a good revival give me a good camp meeting and let's go ain't nothing else like it this side of heaven he makes us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus brother Bob said he'd move from Michigan to Alabama to sit in the in the company of good saints. Yeah. Ain't nothing else like it right. in the world. Amen. Hallelujah. I drive from Alabama clear across this country. If I knew where I was going, I was going to get help. Yeah. It ain't the drive. Right. It's the company I'll be in when I get there. That's right. That's right. In the fellowship of those of like precious I'm glad I ain't got to go far. Live in that rental house in Silver Hill. I ain't got to go but 20 minutes. I can be in a powerful church service. Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night. Ain't nothing else like it in all the world. Give it to me. Y'all just lay out. Y'all just stay at home. I, why would I want to do that? I love this. Give it to me. I need it. I desire it. I want it. I'll be fighting hell tomorrow, but I'm in church tonight. He'll be on my back tomorrow trying to torment me. Tonight, he's under my feet. Give it to me. Ain't nothing else like that in all the world. I just want to say to you tonight, Thank you. you're on the run. Your enemy, your adversary is chasing you and hounding you and wearing you out. 
we see an answer in our Bible. David went to the house of God. He sought out the ministry of the priesthood. He said, can you help me? I'm hungry. He said, yep, we baked showbread this morning. And if you've hallowed yourself over the last three days, you can have it. It's holy. He said, we're hallowed. It'll help us. Hallelujah. Sometimes I need God to nourish me with the word of God. I need God to speak to me. He said, got anything I can fight this devil off of me with? Got a spear. Got a sword. He said, oh, man, we ain't fighters. We preachers. He said, but I got Goliath's sword, the one you used to cut his head off. He wrapped that up in a linen cloth, brought it here to the house of God. I got it laying in there behind the ephod. You can have it. You want it. Give that to me. Ain't nothing else like that in all the land. The victory and the power that it represents. I want it. I need it in my life. David left the house of God that day the same way God wants you to leave tonight. Nourished and empowered. Hallelujah. Nourished and empowered. Do it again right here in this house tonight. Feed somebody's soul. And oh God, strengthen somebody's heart and life in the power of the Holy Ghost. If you're able, stand with me tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for the spirit, the unction that he gives. My God, the answer that he brings the nourishment that he fills us with and the power that he empowers us by. God, I pray that you would open up the windows of heaven and you would rain on us around this altar tonight. And God, those that stand in need of salvation would be saved. God, that through the gift of repent, conviction and repentance, their sins might be cast from them as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against them and they can go home with a clean slate born again, their name in the book of life, those that came sick, infirm, crippled, disabled, or diseased in body could be well, could be whole, that they might be healed in Jesus' name and that every one of us as believers will be renewed in the power of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and that with fire. My God, equipping us as believers with a testimony. We're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Oh God, in answer to prayer, let it be our testimony that God, that God is our refuge and strength the present help in trouble. Let it be our testimony that this poor man cried and he answered me out of his holy hill. Thank God. Let it be this man's testimony, Lord. I was sick in body and I raised my voice and he healed me. Let it be, oh God, I came weak. He empowered me in his spirit and I left strong. May you use that in the days to come in a hurting world, oh God. May our life be a light to some soul. That's your heart's desire. Would you meet me in this altar tonight? Those that are, are at home, I challenge you to make you an altar where you are right now. Pray with us somewhere and believe God with us. He's going to help you where you are. Thank you, Lord.